so to continue, you know, so my background is as a copyright lawyer, um, but I'm also a part of two online digital archives. One is called Padma, which is the public access digital media archive. Uh, and the other is called Indian Cinema, which is really a film kind of archive. Uh, but of course, before I actually, you know, got into media and copyright law, I actually began my career working in Dharamsala. So I was working after I finished my master's, I worked <clears throat> with the Tibetan Center for Human Rights and Democracy uh, uh, for around eight or nine months. Uh, and I've been involved in a way, you know, with a continued interest in questions related to the, you know, Tibetan self-determination movement. Uh, so I hope I'll be able to make a connection between these two seemingly disparate areas. What I'll do is I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, <clears throat> Can all of you see the screen? Yes. Yes. Great. All right, so let me uh, first begin with this entire question of, you know, what do we think um, when, when we think about the, you know, philosophy of archiving, uh, in what manner uh, am I using this idea of the philosophy of archiving and why do I think it is uh, it offers us a new paradigm for thinking about questions of intellectual property and, and, and copyright, et cetera. Uh, you know, Milan Kundera has a line where he says, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And if there is one line which in a way encapsulates the will to archiving or the necessity of archiving, for me, it's this line. And this line becomes all the more crucial when placed within a political context, right? When you're talking about not just uh, some generic idea of the necessity of memory. But when you're talking about, you know, political situations in which there is the domination uh, of one form of memory over another. Now we know this, uh, you know, no instance is a better example of this than the Tibetan uh, movement, where the question of what remains uh, within the realm of public memory is exactly the site of struggle, right? I mean, in a way, it's not just about the obliteration uh, of a nationhood. It's also about the obliteration of the memories uh, of a culture. And it's in this context, I think that the politics of memory and the politics of forgetting becomes very crucial, right? Uh, memory is not some natural form. Memory is mediated by, by forms of technology. Memory is mediated by forms of politics and memory is mediated by, in a way, kind of the unequal distribution uh, of the resources of remembering. And it's in that context that archives become very crucial. There's a French philosopher called Jacques Derrida who says that there is no political power without the control of the archive, if not memory. Effective democratization can always be measured by this essential criterion. The participation in and access to the archive, its constitution and interpretation. And this is really in a way kind of, you know, it lays out the kind of precise uh, contours of the problem that we're looking at. This question of, you know, the, the control of the archive. Now, etymologically, it's interesting that the word archive itself comes to us in a way from a legal basis because the etymology and the origin of the word archive comes to us from archaeon, uh, which was literally the magistrate's home, right? The magistrate's house is where you know, official documents are placed where in a way official memory is made. So how do we think about the relationship in a way between official practices of remembering and official practices of forgetting along with it being a site of struggle? How in other words, does one insert oneself into the archive? How can one claim and appropriate the archive? And how can one in a way contest, you know, a limited form of public memory by creating one's own archives. If I had to name in a way kind of the political impulses that draw, draws me uh, towards the thinking of archives, it's primarily this. And it also has to do with the fact that the landscape and the terrain of archiving has entirely transformed you know, in the last two decades. And that's primarily because of the digital moment, right? It's, uh, it's amazing how many of us go about our daily lives uh, with our computers, with our hard drives, with our kind of, you know, traversing through the internet, as it were, uh, doing what would typically have been 
the specialized and narrow domain of librarians and archivists. All of us are constantly cataloging, we are filing, we are classifying, and we are arranging, right? Whether it is in the professional context or in a personal capacity. But this idea that we now live our lives uh, partly as though we were librarians and archivists ourselves should give us pause to think about what then is an archive. Because very typically, one has always associated archives uh, with a certain kind of a monumental scale, right? So you think, for example, about the national archives of countries, right? Uh, archives have always been, in a way, the repositories of large national memories. But if you just compare, it's incredible how technologically we are at a, at a cusp where the scale of what one is able to actually you know, contain is literally unimaginable. To give you an example, uh, the biggest library in the world, the largest library is the Library of Congress. Now, hopefully the jokers in the last two days haven't damaged any part of the Library of Congress when they try to take over Capitol Hill, but uh, the Library of Congress contains 35 million books. Unimaginable, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's the scale of it is really quite something. At the same time, if you actually think about the processes of digitization, right? And if you think about the fact that assuming a single book were available in a digital format uh, and the size of the book were around one MB, it's estimated by, that by 2030, we're going to have the capacity for SD cards to be able to contain or to hold 60 terabytes of data. We've already seen how in the last 10 years, you know, the size of hard drives have really shrunk and their capacity to hold data has, has increased. So we're talking about like another 10 years time where it will technically be possible to hold, you know, 60 terabytes of data on an SD card, which typically would mean that you can hold almost up to two libraries of Congress on an SD card. And that's the crazy, crazy time that we're living in, right? So when we think about archives, it's no longer in a way, the brick and mortar kind of model of this logic of, you know, the archive being the dusty place, the archive being this kind of, you know, old crumbly building where papers and documents are assigned to die. But between these two moments and these two images, on the one hand, an image of the archive where you're obsessed with the question of the fragility of paper. And on the other, the technological kind of hubris and arrogance of what is seemingly infinite in the realm of the technological, you know, of technological possibilities. Now, between these two extremes, I think there is something that needs to be thought about. And that's really why I want to look at this question of the archival instinct. And how does this figure of the archivist help us to think about many issues of the contemporary. The 21st century has been marked in a way by a certain will to archive, right? The desire to archive, everyone is creating archives. Everyone is talking about archives. And the question is why? You know, I think that if one were to think about archives as forms, every era throws a set of questions or throws a set of problems uh, to which they believe a form of a certain kind is the answer. So if you look, for example, at the 19th century, in the 19th century, you know, with industrialization, with the kind of the, the, the acceleration of life and with the availability after the print revolution uh, of the kind of information that was available, information was seen to be chaotic. There was just too much information, right? And people didn't know how to classify and how to make sense of this information. So in the 19th century, you have a will to encyclopedias. Everyone is running after and creating encyclopedias. The idea is to create some kind of a manageable form uh, that this ocean of information can kind of you know, uh, reside in. In the context of the internet and in the context of the digital revolution, I would argue that there is something similar that's happening. We all know that 
on a daily basis, we now receive, you know, maybe hundreds, if not thousands of WhatsApp messages, SMSs, emails, the combination of it. Very often you get really interesting things that you find someone has shared with you. Uh, and a week later, a month later, and certainly two years later, you remember it, but you don't know where it is any longer, right? It's literally lost in the sea of information that you have. So in a way, <clears throat> every technology that we have right now, uh, as Marshall McLuhan famously said, media is an extension of the senses, right? Is that TV is an extension of the eye, um, you know, earphones are an extension of the ear. And in that same way, the computer is an extension of the brain. But the computer now is seen to be, in a way, kind of the machine that does a lot of what you had to do normally, which is the act of remembering. And it's in this context that the question of archives becomes very crucial. The will to archive is born simultaneously from the technological availability of tools to archive, but also from the anxiety caused by the fact that these tools that are supposed to help us remember are making us increasingly forget a lot more. And this paradoxical situation and this kind of you know, tension between the two, there's a very lovely story by one of my favorite writers, an Argentinian writer called Jorge Luis Borges. And the story is called Funus the Memorius. The story tells the tale of a young man out on a horse ride. And unfortunately for him, he has an accident and he falls and he lands on his head. Now, contrary to what you would assume that you would you know, lose your memory if you hit your head uh, on, on, on the ground, Funus, instead something happens where he's able to remember every single thing. He's able to remember the first time he ever tasted you know, a chocolate. He's able to remember the first time his feet touched the grass. This is ironical thing where Funus is now unable to forget. So Funus decides that he's going to reconstruct every single memory that he's ever had in his life. And he begins, of course, the paradox is that for you to remember one lifetime, you will require many lifetimes, right? And this story in a way illustrates the paradox that we are in. We are at a point where we can technically store, save, and record everything. But then what does it mean to store, save, and record everything, right? And this is really one of the questions. And, and in a way, what I want to do is I want to bring together these two frameworks that I've given you, that the archivist is drawn to a profession where he's committed to remembering, and he's worried about the loss of memory, uh, and at the same time, there is a certain kind of uh, madness inherent, you know, in the act of archiving, of what you archive and how much you archive. And I want to tell you two stories. These are stories of two of my personal heroes. The first one is called Hen uh, is someone called Henry Langlois. Now, in 1968, when the student movement was happening in in France and in the rest of the world, uh, in Paris, the student movement was also led by a lot of young filmmakers. Many of the great filmmakers that we know today, uh, Francois Truffaut, Jean-Luc Godard, all of them were part of the 68 movement. Uh, and Charles de Gaulle, the then president of France, uh, whenever he asked anyone, you know, who is behind this movement? Who, who, who are the leaders? And people said Henry Langlois. So Charles de Gaulle very famously said, who is this Henry Langlois? Right? Uh, and maybe the answer can be given to us by Bernardo <coughs> Bertolucci, the famous Italian filmmaker, who said, the best and only school for the cinema is to go to the cinema and not waste time studying theory in film schools. The best school of cinema in the world is the Cinematique in Paris, and the best professor is Henry Langlois. So Langlois was basically a film buff, a cinephile, who started the Cinematique, which is you know, one of the greatest film archives in the world now. But what motivated him to do this? In the 1930s, Langlois discovered to his horror, as someone who was just getting into the world of cinema, that 95% of the early films from France did not actually exist. That most of them uh, had already vanished or had been destroyed. Uh, you must recall that the early days of cinema, the medium of film was silver nitrate. 
And silver nitrate was a highly flammable medium, right? So easily prone to being burnt and fire uh, is the greatest kind of, you know, nightmare for most archivists, right? The idea that paper can be destroyed so easily by fire, by water, etc. cetera. Uh, so Langlois basically started collecting wherever he could, you know, films. If he needed to, he stole them. If he borrowed them, he never returned them. And he started basically keeping the entire collection of films in his house, except that he didn't have place. At the end of the day, once his collection started growing, he ran out of place. So of course he started using his bathtub uh, as the store, storage space for all of the films, uh, which leads me to wonder how many times you know, he, he had a bath uh, in his life. Uh, but this was his commitment. This was his mad passion. And then while he was doing all of this and creating in a way, you know, the, the, the cinema theme, World War II broke out. When World War II broke out, he was worried about the Nazis uh, destroying, you know, his treasures and all of the things that he had collected with so much kind of love and care. So what he did was he went about all his friends' houses, asking them to dig up their gardens. And he hid all of the, you know, kind of film reels in the garden. Uh, and once World War II ended, he then went to every person's house, dug up the entire garden, retrieving all his precious treasures. And with that, he set up the Cinematheque, right? Arguably one of the greatest film archives now in the world. What is interesting though, of course, was that many of the film producers saw Henry Langlois as their enemy. They didn't see him as being someone who was passionately driven by a love for cinema. They saw him as a pirate. They saw him as a thief uh, who was stealing, quote unquote, their films without their permission. And this is a tension that persists. It's a th tension that we will encounter when we look at the entire relationship between you know, archiving, the archival instinct and, and copyright. Uh, <clears throat> but the Langlois story, uh, <clears throat> writing about Langlois, John Monroe, 1963 said, it should be remembered that academic historians consider all archivists to be pirates anyway, constantly on the lookout for booty, reaching, <clears throat> racing each other to it, and stealing from each other with abandon. Yeah? My second story, oh, Langlois had one more thing, which was a, a, a lovely line, where he said that the best way to preserve films is to show them. They're like Persian carpets, they have to be walked on. And this is very important because very often, Archivists, in their zeal to protect material, have ended up becoming gatekeepers who basically deny access and permission to the material. Langlois' philosophy was the best way for you to preserve something is to make sure that people use it. Yeah? My next story and my next hero is a painter of signs and a collector of books uh, from Chennai, then Madras, a person called Roja Mutaya. Roja Mutaya was basically, uh, <clears throat> he, he, he lived in the 50s and the 60s, uh, and he was basically a painter of science. But he wasn't a very successful painter of science because Roja Mutaya's passion was books, right? And he was really passionate about collecting old books. So he didn't pay much attention to his business. He was constantly found uh, on the amongst the old booksellers of Madras, where he was known as the madman who would buy rubbish and who would buy basically junk, right? Uh, now, as a result of his um, bibliomania and his kind of passion for books, his business as a as a painter of science didn't do too very too well. So he packed up his business and he went back uh, to the village that he came from, to the small town that he came from, and he started a small little library right, where for 25 pesta, you would be given a plate of idlis, you would be given a cup of coffee, and you would be allowed to browse his material, right, and he, which he lovingly kind of, you know, took care of. And he was constantly short of money. And whenever he ran out of money, and his family were, were, were just couldn't understand uh, what he was up to, right, why he was running this crazy little library, why he was constantly chasing after junk, uh, and his, whenever he ran out of money, he would rummage through his collections and he would look for like an old stamp. 
And he would take it out and send it to a stamp collector and tell the person, I don't know what the value of the stamp is, but please send me whatever you think it is worth. And this is how he, he, he constantly kind of kept uh, you know, uh, kept his 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 work going, and he was also someone who would be found rummaging in kind of trash, you know, amongst garbage. So whatever people had thrown, here was this respectable man who was like rummaging through the garbage uh, to save anything that he thought thought to be of value. So he was in a way a kind of the mad collector, right? But then something changed. Something crucial happened in 1983. Uh, which changed everything. And this is basically the beginning of the civil war in Sri Lanka. There was the pogrom that happened in Jaffna, where, you know, the Sinhalese army basically kind of, you know, uh, undertook a massacre in, 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 in Jaffna, including burning the library of Jaffna. Roja Mutaya, sitting in Madras, hears about this in a kind of a filmy, dramatic fashion. He pawns his possessions, his wife's jewelry, raises the money to go to Jaffna to see what he could salvage. And he finds that many of the rarest of rare manuscripts have been burnt down in the fire of Jaffna. Roja Mutaya goes as a mad collector, but he comes back as an archivist. And he decides to commit his life to saving whatever he could of early Tamil print culture. And he did this for like a long time till the late eighties when his health started deteriorating. And he, he realized that he couldn't do this for too long. So he offered to sell his entire collection to the government of Madras for a princely sum of two lakh rupees, right? And at that point of time, he already had more than 120,000 individual items in his collection. So something like one rupee 50 paisa per item is what he had priced his collection at. The government of Madras and the, national, the, the, the state archives <clears throat> had a look at Roja Mutaya's collection uh, and they thought it was not valuable. They thought that this is, they said, you know, why should we pay two lakhs to buy junk from someone? So they refused his offer. Thankfully, by then, a number of scholars who were particularly working on Tamil literary history had started discovering Roja Mutaya's collection. And so a, a, a feminist scholar who was working on kind of the history of the women's movement in Tamil Nadu was using uh, Roja Mutaya's collection. And she happened to be a fellow at the Uni University of Chicago at that point of time. So she approached the University of Chicago and told them of this extremely valuable collection uh, in South India, which they might be interested in. The head of the University of Chicago South Asia collection, James Nye, came down and they saw the collection and they negotiated and they agreed to buy the entire collection for one crore. Roja Mutaya laid down the condition at that point of time that the collection should not leave India that a copy of the collection would be made available in the University of Chicago, but that the collection itself would remain in India. And that has been the basis for the setting up of the Roja Mutaya Memorial Library in Chennai, which is arguably now one of the finest archives in the country with absolutely committed, you know, kind of uh, archivists, librarians working on this. And if anyone's interested in speaking to my friend Sundar, who's the director of the archive, uh, he would be delighted uh, to help out with, with this. Now, the irony of this entire story is that Roja Mutaya did not live to see any of the money that he, he got from his collection. And what did Roja Mutaya die of? Paradoxically and iron ironically, he died of breathing disorders caused by years and years of breathing the fumes of the TNT that he had been spraying to preserve his material, right? So literally, you know, the will to archiving and the will to, to death in, in the case of someone like Roja Mutaya uh, <clears throat> are actually the same. So if you take these two figures, Henry Langlois and Roja Mutaya, there are clearly overlaps between them. Both of them are driven by the passion for preserving memory. Both of them are driven by the anxiety and the fear of the loss 
of physical tangible material. And both of them realize that there is a need for materials to be housed. And I use the word housed very carefully. I use it literally in the context of what it means to provide a shelter for memory uh, becomes the crucial kind of question. So Derrida, who I already mentioned, says he describes this <clears throat> phenomenon as archive fever. He says it's, it's like a malady. It's like, a, it's like an illness, but it's an illness that you don't have a choice uh, but to live in. And he says, <clears throat> archive fever is to burn with a passion. It is never to rest interminably from searching for the archive right where it slips away. It is to run after the archive. It is to have a compulsive, repetitive, and nostalgic desire for the archive, an irrepressible desire to return to the origin, a homesickness, a nostalgia for the return to the most archaic place of absolute commencement. Now, while Derrida was writing about archives and about the instinct of archivists, I would ask all of us to think if we had to just replace the word archive with the idea of the refugee, the idea of the exile, what is a state of homelessness and what is a state of political exile if not to burn with a passion, to never rest and to interminably search and have a compulsive repetitive desire to return to the origin, a homesickness. And it's in this way I feel that, you know, the interest of the Tibetan community in the question of archiving uh, is something that actually lends a certain kind of a political urgency as well as a conceptual uh, and philosophical richness uh, to the task of archiving itself. And I'd ask you to keep this in mind when thinking about, you know, what are the kind of archives that one can imagine. One of my favorite images <clears throat> from, again, you know, World War II uh, is from a little town in Italy. People rushing in to save books from a local library in the aftermath of the war, right, in the, in the context of bombings, etc. And these stories continue over and over and over again. There's a beautiful little book called The Secret Library of Syria, which is an account of the efforts of two men trying to save the libraries of Syria in the ongoing war that has been happening. Absolutely lovely book if anyone's interested in, in, in reading it. So let me now turn from, you know, in a way kind of my own conceptual and uh, philosophical interest in archives to the question of copyright. And how does copyright you know, come into the entire picture? Uh, <clears throat> you need to remember that, you know, in a way, the making of libraries, the making of archives is always through the material that, with, through material that doesn't belong to you. You're never the owners of material. You're always the custodians of, of, of material, right? And copyright law is a domain of law that basically grants ownership and exclusive rights in intangible materials, right? In, in, in the world of uh, literature, music, cinema, software, databases, et cetera, et cetera. So what are some of the core concepts of copyright and how do they overlap with, with, with archives? First is how do you distinguish between tangible and intangible property? The answer is very simple. You think about a phone, a phone is a tangible object, right? I mean, I can say that I am the owner of this phone. But residing within this phone are over half a million intellectual property claims, right? From copyright to patent. There are every aspect from the swipe uh, to the drag and drop, every aspect is covered by some form of intellectual property or the other. And that's the intangible part. If you think about a book, I may be the owner of a book. And if I don't like the book, although I would never recommend this to anyone, even if they hate a book, I can burn the book, I can tear the book, I can scratch out, I can write, I can do anything that I want physically to the book. But does it mean that I can, if I don't like the book, that I can rewrite the book? That I basically take the entire plot and I say, you know, I didn't like the fact that Gandalf dies or I didn't like the fact that Dumbledore dies in the Harry Potter series, I'm going to write my own Harry Potter where Dumbledore doesn't die, right? Uh, and, and they don't. And 
in there, you would run into problems, right? And that's really the intangible aspect. So intellectual property and copyright in general deal with this world of how can one grant property rights to ideas? And there's a problem. Huh? I'm, I'm an anti-copyright person. I have to make that very clear. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I mean, it's clearly, you know, uh, there's, there's, a, there's something wrong with the system. But the best way to illustrate the difference between tangible and intangible would be this. Let's assume that Marilyn Monroe wrote letters to you because you were her good friend, right? Uh, and when Marilyn Monroe passed away, obviously there was a great value in the letters of Marilyn Monroe, right? Uh, and you decided that you wanted to auction one of Marilyn Monroe's letters. Uh, would you be entitled to do so? The answer is yes. She wrote the letter to you. You are the owner of the copy of the letter. But you're only the owner of the copy of the letter in its physical form. If you wanted to publish the letter, you wouldn't be allowed to do so because the copyright of the letter remains with Marilyn Monroe. And that's the difference between tangible and intangible property, right? So copyright deals with, in a way, kind of the intangible or that which doesn't really have a physical form. Uh, the, the, intangible manifestation of what are rights. Second crucial concept is authors versus owners, right? We always presume that copyright is the copyright of authors. Fact of the matter is that authors rarely own copyright. Authors have the right to be identified as the authors of the work, and this is called the moral rights that they have. But very often, whether you're an academic, or you're a novelist, you are granting the copyright in your work to the publisher. You are assigning or you're licensing out your work to the publisher. So authors really have actually any control over their own copyright, right? And so this is, this is part of the reason why the copyright system has kind of gone, you know, a little haywire. Uh, it speaks in the name of protecting of the rights of, of authors, but basically it's a system that's entirely controlled by a globalized, entirely corporatized, large network of copyright owners, right? Uh, third key concept, and I'm only giving this to you very briefly. I'm happy to take any questions on this later. Uh, <clears throat> third key concept in copyright, ideas versus expression. What does this mean? We popularly say that copyright protects ideas, but copyright does not protect ideas. There is no copyright over ideas. There is only copyright over the unique expressions of particular ideas. Now, this sounds a little abstract. Let me explain it to you in a much more simple way. What's the difference between an idea and an expression? Let's take boy meets girl. They fall in love. Uh, they run away and they get married. If this were an idea that were protectable, it would be the end of Hindi, Hindi cinema as we know it. Bollywood would be, would be out of business, right? But let's take another kind of expression of the same idea. Boy and girl meet in the UK. Boy and girl go on a Euro trip. Boy and girl initially fight. They fall in love. They return. Girl comes to Punjab. Boy follows girl to Punjab. And you have Dilwale, Dulhaniya Le Jayenge, a unique expression of the idea, boy meets girl, they fall in love. And that's the difference between ideas and expression. Copyright cannot protect ideas and they should not protect ideas because the entire domain of creativity is made possible by a common pool of ideas. And the more you grant property rights to ideas, the more you begin to close you know, this common well of creativity, right? So one of the sustaining myths of copyright, and I call it the middle path of copyright, is that copyright is supposed to be a balance. It is supposed to be a balance between, on the one hand, providing incentives to creators and providing incentive to authors, musicians. And at the same time, it is meant to serve a public good. It is meant to enhance, not to decrease, the quantity as well as quality of material that's available for future generations to build on. That's a balancing act. The question is, how do you balance? 
you know, what are the kind of rights you would grant and what are the kind of rights that you would not grant to ensure that this balance is maintained? Unfortunately, in the last hundred years with the expansion of the copyright industry, we all know that business today is driven by content. Business is driven by entirely in a way by the ownership of content, right? Look at, for example, the film industry, Netflix, Amazon Prime, all of them are content industries. And this is content not created by some small musician sitting in his or her room and writing a song and wanting to make it big. This is a world of globalized, corporate-owned, multi-trillion dollar industries. So what has happened is that over the years, copyright has expanded endlessly. It's expanded in terms of the length of time. If it is supposed to be about the protection of the rights of authors, one question that arises is how do you protect the rights of an author 60 years after the author has died? Because that is the length of copyright. That's the term of copyright. Copyright subsists in a work for 60 years after the death of the author, right? How do you continue to incentivize, you know, someone who's been dead for 60 years? It has expanded in terms of the scope of what it protected. Copyright initially was supposed to be about a very narrow domain of works. Uh, it has now become, you know, broad enough to include just about everything, right? Uh, earlier, there was a requirement of originality as a minimum condition for the satisfaction of copyright that is entirely transformed. And this expansion of copyright can be kind of, you know, uh, humorously illustrated by a story involving a film called Casablanca. Uh, Casablanca was a landmark film, you know, with Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman in the context of World War II, uh, really kind of a cult classic in many ways, right? Uh, a few years after Casablanca came out, a group of filmmakers, uh, three brothers called the Marx Brothers, comedians, made a movie called A Night in Casablanca. Before the movie was released, they got a letter from the lawyer of Warner Brothers, the owners of the copyright in Casablanca, saying that we believe that you are making a movie called A Night in Casablanca, and we believe that this movie is a parody and a spoof of our film. We are writing this letter to prevent you and to injunct you from going ahead with this because this is a violation of our, of our copyright uh, in the film Casablanca. Now, Groucho Marx, known for his wit and humor, wrote a letter back to the Warner Brothers saying that, dear Warner Brothers, uh, I'm afraid I didn't know that there was a copyright in, in, in the word Casablanca uh, and that we were violating your copyright in the word Casablanca. And I apologize for that. But if we are violating your copyright in Casablanca, then I want to point out to you that you're violating our copyright in the word brothers. Because the Marx brothers have been brothers for much longer than the Warner brothers have been brothers. He says, in fact, the Warner brothers are not even all brothers. One of them is only a cousin. And he says, even if you're not violating our rights in the word brothers, then surely you're violating the rights of the word brothers in the brothers Kar Karamazov by Dostoevsky. You're violating the word brothers in the song, Oh Brother, Lend Me a Hand. So he wrote this kind of humorous letter mocking, in many ways, you know, the, 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 the kind of legal, legalese of uh, the Warner Brothers lawyers. He never received a reply, right? But that battle which took place in the, in the early 1950s has really ac accelerated to the point that it's become so common. In fact, the person behind the expansion of copyright is Mickey Mouse. It's Mickey Mouse's value as a copyright, the commercial value of Mickey Mouse, not some innocent, you know, uh, child delighting cartoon figure, but the commercial value of Mickey Mouse that has really been responsible for expanding the scope of copyright, right? So when Mickey Mouse's copyright came or was coming to an end, uh, Disney basically lobbied Congress to extend the term of copyright. And they kept doing this over and over again. And in a similar manner in India, the term of copyright in India used to be for 50 years. But when Rabindranath Tagore's copyright came to an end, they extended the term of copyright by another 10 years. Now, thankfully, we also have a figure in India called Mahatma Gandhi. Because when Gandhi's copyright came to an end, they wanted to extend the term of copyright. But the 
estate of Gandhi said Gandhi was actually against copyright. So how can we allow for an extension of copyright in his name? Uh, and they refused any extension. So the current term of copyright in India is 60 years after the death of the author. Having laid down some of the basics of copyright, let me tell you what the fundamental problem in copyright is. The fundamental problem in copyright pertains to the question of property, personhood, and ownership. What do I mean by this? We're not talking about a mobile phone where I say that, you know, this is something that belongs to me and I own it. It's an object. It can be thrown. It can be, you know, kind of broken. In copyright, you're dealing with a very kind of a sensitive domain. Someone's poem is not just a, an aspect of their property. It's also an aspect of their personhood, right? To now create a legal regime in which you are actually creating an entire property language that deals both with the question of property as well as the question of identity becomes very, very crucial. And this is a case, uh, now let me have a look at the time. Oh, okay, no, I'm not doing well on time at all. Um, you know, we lawyers have a tendency to meander a lot. So maybe I'm gonna rush through this very quickly and I'm gonna, um, you know, literally give you a bullet point summary of the next things so that I can get to the practical part. Uh, anyway, so, the, so I'll skip the story. Uh, the fundamental problem is property, you know, it, copyright creates a system in which, and it's derived philosophically from John Locke, uh, where there is a complete conflation of the idea of the self and the own and the owner, right? So ownership is the heart of copyright law. How does copy, how do, how do archivists allow us to think about other forms? This is a section in which I would have run you through the thoughts of a German philosopher called Walter Benjamin. I'm not going to do that. But basically, summary is that Benjamin's interest was in the figure of the collector. And he said that the collector is not the owner of a work. He is not the source of the work. The collector is someone who's collecting someone else's work. And yet the collector brings a passion to bear on the works that he's collecting. And in bringing this passion, he's actually offering us new terms for thinking about our relationship to the question of property, identity and personhood. And my argument is that what the collector allows us to think about is what does it mean to be a custodian rather than to be an owner of property? What does it mean for you to be interested not in the use value of the property or the exchange value of the property, but instead to be invested in, in, a, in a way in, an, in, a, in a fancier's value, in a collector's value, right? The value of the thing not because of its monetary value or how much utility it gives you, but the value of the thing in itself and in time. And that's really what the collector does. And the collector helps us rethink our relationship to ownership. Okay, now I'm going to skip all of this. Uh, there's a very nice story of Kafka. I'm happy to share a, a book about this uh, to anyone who's interested. But again, in the interest of time, I want to kind of skip to it. And now I want to come to the practical part of the relationship between copyright law and archives. What I've already told you is that, you know, since copyright is an, is an exclusive right owned either by the author or the owner of a work, what happens to people who are intermediaries, right? Like librarians, like archivists, where you don't own the work, right? And yet you want to preserve it and you want people to use it. One of the typical problems that you face is the following. How do you acquire works? What are the rights that you have? For example, can you make photocopies if someone wants to make a copy? Can you digitize the work? Can you lend the work? Can you upload a digital version of the work, right? How do you lend it to somebody else? What if someone takes a work from your archives and uses it publishes something, but doesn't credit your archive with the work. What, in other words, are the do's and don'ts? What are the legal yes and no's when it comes to actually maintaining an archive, right? Unfortunately, copyright law was not written from the perspective of 
archives. Copyright law was not even written from the perspective of users. Copyright law was primarily written from the perspective of owners of copyright. So there's an inherent bias that exists within copyright law. But having said that, because copyright law is a system of balances, you also have what are known as exceptions and limitations in copyright law. And this is the most important part for any librarian or archives. What are exceptions and limitations? Exceptions are, of course, things that cannot be copyrighted or, or over which there is no copyright. So, for example, you know, if you have to say uh, works which are fact, which are data. So if you want to create, for example, a telephone directory, we in the 21st century, no one knows and no one has seen a telephone directory in a long time. But I can assure you that once upon a time, in a not so distant future, there used to be something called a telephone directory where people would look for people's phone numbers, right? Uh, and at that point of time, people knew at least 50, if not 100 phone numbers off the cuff of their head. Uh, right now with mobile phones, it's difficult to imagine anyone knowing more than maybe like two or three numbers, right, off the cuff of their head. But if you wanted to, let's say, create a telephone directory for Dharamsala uh, and you wanted a copyright over it, would you be entitled to a copyright over it? No, because there is no originality in the work, right? So what would happen if I gave you copyright over, let's say, a telephone directory is that I would basically be giving you copyright over facts. And there is a danger of giving copyright over facts because what it means is no one else can use it, right? So that's an exception. A limitation is that while there may be copyright, while you may be the owner, there are various instances in which the law makes exceptions and, and creates limitations on your rights. And that the most important of this is known as fair use. Fair use is a exception granted within the statute to copyright, right? And what, are, what is fair use? One of the most important cases uh, that occurred four years ago, if any of you have studied in Delhi, uh, is a case called the Delhi University photocopy case. Basically, some of the largest publishers in the world, Oxford, Cambridge, sued a small photocopy shop called Rameshwari, which is located in um, the Delhi School of Economics. Now, anyone who's familiar with Mukherjee Nagar will know that Mukherjee Nagar is just littered with photocopy shops. And the beauty of them is that they can actually create photocopied books that look like the original books, right? So this, of course, pissed the entire publishing lot and they filed copyright violation cases. Uh, we were involved in this case representing the students and we made the argument that section 52 of the Copyright Act, which is what the fair use provisions uh, you know, in India are, allows an exception for materials to be given in the course of instruction. And in the course of instruction is not, is not, there's no restriction on quantity, on how much material can be given, as long as it is in the course of instruction. And the courts agreed with the argument. They said that, yes, copyright is a monopoly right. Copyright is an exclusive right. It's an exclusive right in a domain where sh there shouldn't be monopoly rights. But in exchange for this exclusive right that we are giving you, there are also specific use that should be exempted from copyright's reach and from copyright's claim. And they are non-commercial, personal, private use and research. These are very, very, very crucial exceptions for which copyright should not be applicable, right? Now, again, there's some technical things which I'm not going to go into. Let's come to the library exception. Section 5210 of the Indian Copyright Act says the making of not more than three copies of a book, including a pamphlet, sheet of music, map, chart, or plan, by or under the direction of the person in charge of a public library for the use of the public library, if such book is not available for sale in India. Uh, let me also add that this is a section which is an older version of the section. This section was amended in 2012, and I'll come to what the amendment did. This was the exception. It said that if you are basically in charge of a library, you can make up to three copies of a book. 
right? Provided that the book is not available for sale in India. Now, there are all kinds of problems that arise from this. At the time that this law was written, it made sense. If I went to a bookshop and I couldn't find a book, then I could make a copy of the book from the library and keep it in my library. But we live in a time of Amazon and Flipkart. So what does it mean to say that a book is not available? Is availability only conditioned by the question of literally whether it is available or does it also factor in the question of cost? What is the, what is the definition of a public library? If I run a library in a school, is it a public library? So the key problems were three. One, the definition of book. Somehow a book seemed like a very, does a book include a magazine? Does a book include a digital copy of a book? What is a public library? What does the word use mean? And what is not available for sale in India mean, right? All of these problems are very, very crucial. So the position before the 2012 amendment was, this was the position, right? Public library. There's no definition of public library in the Copyright Act. The only place where you will find a definition of, of public library is in the delivery, delivery of books and newspapers, Public Libraries Act of 1954. And what's the definition of a public library in that act? It basically means the National Library at Calcutta and three other libraries, right? Connemara Public Library in Chennai, Delhi Public Library, National Library in Calcutta and Central Library in Mumbai. That's the definition of, of a public library. That's a very, 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 very narrow definition that doesn't help anyone. No library or archive will be able to work under this definition. If you look at state legislations, they're much wider. So for example, the Andhra Pradesh Public Libraries Act says, public library means a library established or maintained by a Zilla Granthalaya Samstha, including the branches and delivery stations, a library maintained by the government, a library established by a local body, or cooperative society and declared open to the public. A library declared to be eligible for aid and receiving aid from the government and from, and from the library fund. Much wider definition. Or if you look at the Maharashtra Public Library in its definition of books, books includes every volume, part, or division of a volume, every sheet of music, map, chart, or plan separately printed, paintings, films, slide discs, or tapes used for audiovisual. So again, you know, this is, it, it's a definition that's cognizant of the 20th century and what a book might be. Similarly, the Gujarat Public Libraries Act, again, extremely wide. It includes computer programs, right? Uh, so after the amendment of 2012, section 52O has been amended. And now the law in India stands as follows. Section 52, as I, again, to remind you, is the law that allows for fair dealing. It said, these are not copyright violations. The making of not more than three copies of a book, including a pamphlet, sheet of music, map, chart, or plan, by or under the direction of the person in charge of a non-commercial public library for the use of the library if such book is not available for sale in India. So the main distinction now is a non-commercial public library, right? Uh, and if we go by the definition that public libraries are not just the four libraries defined in the central law, but public libraries can be defined by state law. It basically means if you're an NGO, if you're a small organization, if you're a school, uh, if you're a collective, as long as you are non-commercial in terms of the library, and as long as it is used and made available to the public in a particular manner, it means that you will be entitled to taking the benefit of Section 52O, right? Of course, the question is what does not available for sale in India mean? And I would argue that not available cannot be narrowly defined in terms of physical availability, but also includes cost. And the reason why cost is important is this. If you take the cost of books and you, you apply what is known as a comparative purchasing price method to it, it leads you to some startling results, right? Let's take, for example, Harry Potter and the Deadly Hallows. The book costs $24 in US, uh, in, in India, let's say. Now, it costs $24 in the US, it costs $24 in India. The argument of the publishers would be, well, you know, the book is the same cost. So why should it matter, right? You should be able to buy the book on Amazon for the same cost. The problem is, that's a faulty assumption. If you take the GDP 
of India and you compare with the GDP of uh, the US, and especially if you take it in terms of the per capita income along with GDP, then what you need to do is, what is $24 as a percentage of, of the GDP per capita in India compared with the US? And you take that percentage and you say, if someone in the US were paying the same percentage, what would they pay? Let's take Harry Potter. In Harry Potter's case, $24 amounts to something like 2.4% of the GDP per capita in India. If someone in the US were paying 2.4%, how much would they have to pay to buy Harry Potter? The answer is $1,042. If everyone were expected to pay $1,000 to buy a Harry Potter book, the question is, the student, the librarian, all of which embody a public interest perspective will really expand the domain of copyright. Internationally, there have been a lot of movements of librarians increasingly getting involved in the domain of copyright reform. So there is, for example, a proposed treaty on exceptions and limitations for librarians and archives, which seeks to expand what are the exceptions that are actually relevant there? Uh, I'm happy to share material with all of you on any of these if you want in, in, in detail. Uh, but let me end with one thing which brings together, you know, in a way, the two uh, dimensions that I've spoken about. I began the first half of my, uh, my, my talk with the philosophy of archiving and the importance, in a way, of a philosophical perspective on archiving itself. And then I went to the second realm of looking at the entire question of the politics of copyright and the politics of ownership and why, in a way, uh, the language of exclusion and the language of exclusive rights has created a kind of slightly warped, slightly broken system. And why going back to the language of archiving and the language of a custodian allows us a articulation of an ethical imagination of copyright. And I want to end with a story from a book called The Little Prince. In The Little Prince, The Little Prince has a, a planet uh, where he goes about meeting different people on different planets. And one of the planets that he goes to is owned by a businessman. And he asks the businessman, what, you, what, what is it that you do? So the businessman says, I own stars. He says, you own stars? What do you mean by you own stars? He says, you look, every single star that you see, I'm the owner of these stars. He says, oh, that's great. And what do you do with the stars that you own? So the businessman says, I sell stars. And I make money and I make profit out of them. And he says, and what do you do with the money that you, you, you make? So the businessman says, I buy more stars. So the little prince is a little perplexed. And he says, I don't understand. And he tells the businessman, he says, you know, I also own some things. I own two volcanoes in my planet and I own a little plant. And every day I clean the volcano and I water my plants, even the, the volcano that doesn't work, because one day that volcano might work. And he says, I am of use to the things that I own, but you are of no use to the things that you own. So he's in a way, the little prince is bringing back the language of responsibility and of care to what it is that you own. And if there is one class,